Hello fellow fiends! Welcome to episode 3 of season 6 of Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces. I am your host, Cassiopeia. Don't forget, you can catch me every Friday with brand new episodes of the creepiest and spookiest content. And if you subscribe to the Patreon or the Anchor webpage, um, for as little as $5 a month, you'll get bonus episodes every other Tuesday. Um, you get a merchandise discount that's good on every purchase and um, all the items in the Wiccan Face shop. And you get a little thank you welcome box. So definitely check that out. Um, if you would like to support without subscribing, because I know sometimes, you know, times gets tough. Um, times gets tough. That's exactly what I just said. <laughs> uh, times get tough tough and but you still want to kind of help support uh your favorite podcast shows and things like that so i have a cash app and a venmo that you can send to but also just you know purchasing items in the wick and fay merchandise store um the wick and fay candles um all of the items uh definitely every little bit helps um, also, if you are a small business or if you're a big business and you're looking to get your content and your items and things like that out there, I also have ad space. And if you send me an email to creepycases.spookyspaces at gmail.com, I can send you all of the um, budget friendly, uh, <laughs> so to speak, uh, packages that I offer. Um, so without further ado, let's get started on this week's episode. Um, now, before we jump into today's episode, I want to warn you of its content. Uh, this episode talks of abuse, harm, and the murder of a young child. Uh, some of the descriptions are graphic and rather disturbing, and they're not for the faint of heart or the ears of the little ones. Um, so I do say please proceed at your own risk. It was early afternoon on July 27, 1981, when a mother and her six-year-old son enter a Sears department store in a Hollywood, Florida shopping center. Now, while she was visiting the lighting section, she let the young boy join some other children playing a video game in the toy department just a few aisles away. Now, less than 10 minutes later, when she returned for her son, he was gone. The frantic mother began searching the store, having her son paged, but there was no sign of him. The family called the police and the case quickly made local and national headlines. But it would be only a few weeks later on August 10th when a couple of fishermen would find the boy's severed head in a canal near Vero Beach over a hundred miles away. It would then take 27 years before the case would be named closed. Now, this is the creepy case of Adam Walsh. victims' rights activist, and the host and creator of America's Most Wanted, John Edward Walsh Jr. was born in Auburn, New York, to John Walsh Sr. and Jean Walsh. He graduated from the University of Buffalo in 1967 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history, and he married Reve Drew in 1971. Now, after college, they settled in South Florida, where John took a job building high-end luxury hotels. Their lives would soon be derailed. In the summer of 1981, John was an official with Paradise Island Hotel and Casino in the Bahamas while he was also working in Hollywood, Florida, when his six-year-old son, Adam, went missing from the Hollywood Mall, which is now the Hollywood Hills Plaza. 
Now, Revae had left Adam in the toy department to watch some other boys play a video game after he promised not to move from the spot while she shopped for a lamp in the next department over. Less than 10 minutes later, Revae returned and Adam and the boys were gone. Now, police records from Adam's case, which were released in 1996, tell that a 17-year-old security guard, which I kind of feel like 17 is a little young to be a security guard, but neither here nor there, um, she asked a group of older boys to leave due to a scuffle over whose turn it was to play the video game. Now, when asked if their parents were present, the older boy said no, and the Walshes say that Adam was a rather shy and kind of timid child, and so he most likely didn't speak up to say that his mother was indeed in the store, and the security guard presumed that he was with the older kids and just had him leave along with them. Now, once outside the mall, the boys obviously would have all gone their separate ways, leaving little Adam alone. And it's presumed that this is when he was abducted. Now, this was when Rive had Adam paged while she continued to search the store for him. And she actually ran into her mother-in-law, Jean, during this time who helped her look. Now, after about 90 minutes of coming up empty-handed, Rive called Hollywood police at around 1.55 p.m. Now, she and Jean searched the rest of the mall as John assisted the uniformed officers. A massive, massive search began for the young boy, and along with a $100,000 reward for his return. Posters read, we are willing to negotiate any ransom on any terms, uh, strict confidence, do not fear revenge, we will not prosecute, we just want our son. Sadly, only a few weeks later, on August 10th, 1981, around 6.45 p.m., two fishermen, Robert Hughes and Vernon Bailey, discovered Adam's severed head in a drainage canal near the Florida Turnpike in Vero Beach about 120 miles away. Now, it's sad because the next day, August 11th, John Monahan, a family friend, was the one to identify the body because John and Reve were actually on Good Morning America putting out a plea for the safe return of Adam. Now, Dr. Ronald Wright of Broward County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed the body was Adam using dental records and he was missing his two front teeth. So it was a little easier um, for them. Now he ruled the cause of death asphyxiation and the state of the remains suggested that Adam died around 10 days prior to being discovered. An autopsy shows that he had five distinct blows from a sharp bladed instrument to the back of the neck and the lower rear part of the skull. Sadly, the rest of his remains were never found. Now, investigators interviewed and ran extensive background checks on Adam's immediate family, um, including his parents, his grandmother Jean, his uncle, and two friends including John Monahan, um, none of who were implicated or um, they were all ruled out and found not to be involved. On August 18th, Reve Walsh met with detectives to provide an in-depth run-through of her and Adam's day before he disappeared. It started off like any other. Around 8 a.m., she woke up. Adam woke up around 8.30 and John left for work around nine. Now between nine and 9.30, James Campbell came by to have breakfast and he left around 10. Reve and Adam left for St. Mark's Lutheran School to pay for tuition around 11, and she got to the mall around 12.30. Now, she was even put under hypnosis, and throughout her um, recollection, uh, she didn't remember seeing anything suspicious. She didn't remember seeing any 
suspicious people or anything that would catch her attention. Now, other employees of both the school and Sears placed all of the events slightly earlier, but Reve said that she wasn't wearing her watch that day, so she could be off a little bit on the timeline of events, and she took a polygraph and passed without deception. Now, mall shoppers provided a story of seeing a tall man with curly hair following Adam out of the store. And he went to a navy blue van, which pulled up next to Adam as he was sitting on the curb by himself. They said the side door opened and Adam was pulled inside. Now, Wednesday, August 19th, detectives received a call from Madison County Sheriff Deputy Fred Respris informing them that 25-year-old Michael Kelly of Merritt Island was arrested for driving under the influence. A search of his car revealed a machete. And Kelly claimed that he had information important to the Adam Walsh case, but as they questioned him, they felt he appeared to be mentally unstable, which I've seen this happen in past cases where somebody comes forward with information and they say, well, this person doesn't seem like they're stable or maybe they, you know, they don't seem right in the head, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're making it up. So like, keep that in mind because you never know what, what could come of it. Now they did listen as Michael told them about Kim Morin, a 25-year-old man from Titusville. He stated that six years prior, Moran told him he was going to kill children. He claimed that he heard, it fr heard from him in like a year, but two weeks prior to Adam's death, his machete had disappeared from his closet. And his father stated that he put the machete in the closet and it was there until Michael took it with him to his brother's house. So, let's see. His mother said that he was acting a little strange and even hallucinated about drug dealers following him. Now, Michael had an alibi and forensic tests proved that his machete was not used to sever Adam's head. The police received multiple calls and tips on various suspects, all leading nowhere. So Adam's case went cold. Until October 11, 1983, 36-year-old Otis Elwood Toole of Jacksonville, Florida, an inmate of the Duval County Jail, tells that he was responsible for the abduction and murder of Adam Walsh. Now, he claims that he and his partner, Henry Lee Lucas, which these two were depraved serial killers who raped, murdered, and cannibalized 600 people in the 1970s, or so they claim. The number is actually probably closer to 108, um, however, uh, Still a high number, um, but nowhere near the 600 mark. Now, he claimed that he and his partner, Henry Lee Lucas, abducted a 6 to 10-year-old boy from a Sears mall in the Fort Lauderdale area and killed him. Now, October 19th, 1983, he told detectives that he wanted to confess the murder and forget about it. His story was full of inconsistencies, though. He said the boy was 7 to 10, blonde, curly hair, blue jeans, a blue shirt, and sneakers. Now, while Adam was 6, of course, that age range is still very close to what um, Tool claimed. Mm. Um, he had brown hair, which was straight. Um, he was also wearing green shorts a red and white Izod shirt, and yellow rubber thongs. So completely different than the description that Tool gave. Now, he also implicated Lucas as the one who pulled the boy into the van, cut off the head with the bayonet, 
and performed sexual acts with it. Except Henry Lee Lucas was actually in a Maryland state jail on July 27, 1981, when Adam was taken. The detectives questioned the legitimacy and tool changed the story to say that he was alone and he actually only implicated Lucas as revenge. Now, he said that he lured Adam with toys and candy, and as Adam began to cry for his mother, he beat him unconscious. He claims that he sexually assaulted him before cutting off his head. He then drove around with the head in his car for days as he kept forgetting to get rid of it. Ooh, I think that's something that I would, I mean, I would never have a severed head in my car, but I think that that would be something I'd probably remember to get rid of if I ever did. He said that he finally tossed it into the canal. When they inspected his car, there was actually a blood outline of Adam's face in the carpet. Now, over the years, police continued to interview people who knew Tool, his cellmates giving detailed information on the case. In 1991, William Missler of Hollywood, Florida, saw an, art saw an article on Adam Walsh. Now, he was 33 years old in 1981 and was at the mall on the day of his disappearance. And he said that he watched a man lure a young boy he believed to be Adam into a 1971 black over white Cadillac with faded black interior with a small dent in the rear bumper. Now, I totally get it. You want to mind your own business? You don't want to get involved. However, why would you, A, not step in and help the little boy? Um, B, why would you not speak up sooner? Why would you not get the cops involved right away? Um, now, I do get that he thought Tool was actually arrested for this crime in 1983. But like I said, why wouldn't you say something as you saw it happen? Um, you could have prevented the entire the incident, possibly. Now, on October 21st, Tool was taken to Hollywood, Florida, where he took investigators to that mall. He states that this is where he took Adam from. He then took them to mile marker 126, which had a secluded entrance near the turnpike. And this is where he claims he decapitated Adam and buried his remains. Um, he said he wasn't sure where that exact location was because he was intoxicated. October 26th, Tool then claimed he wasn't sure if Adam was even the kid he took. Then a few minutes later, he claimed that he didn't take Adam. And then even a few minutes after that, he changed his story again. He said he actually took Adam. But after he severed his head, he took the body to Jacksonville, um, to his mother's house, placed the rest of the remains in a fridge, and burned it. And he then put the ashes in a blanket and dumped it at a north dump. Now, the owner of a parking lot where Tool used to park his car found a machete in one of the cars. It had a wooden handle wrapped in electrician's tape, and a green webbed sheath, as Tool had described his very own. Now, tests detected traces of blood, but this was prior to DNA, you know, advanced technology, so it didn't really specify, specify blood type to enable comparison to Adam. Now, follow-up tests were basically futile as blood wasn't really lifted from the machete or the sheath so trace evidence was initial with testing in 1983 and by the time they could retest it the passage of time um, had deteriorated any remaining evidence that could have been lifted now when the cadillac was recovered in 1983 it tested positive for blood on the left and rear floorboards, uh, front and rear floorboards, where Tool said that he placed Adam's severed head. 
Now in 1995, follow-up testing couldn't be done as the sample, samples that were removed couldn't be found. And even though Tool was a very likely suspect, there just wasn't enough evidence to charge him. He had admitted to hundreds of murders that he had no involvement in, so it was really uh, difficult to, to take him at his word and accept that confession. In 1996, Toole died in prison of cirrhosis and complications from AIDS at age 49 while serving a life sentence for his other crimes. Later, his niece told John Walsh that he had made a deathbed confession that he did actually, in fact, murder Adam Walsh. Now, years later, another name was looked at in the case as a possible suspect. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was residing in South Florida at the time of Adam's abduction, was considered. Now, his victims were as young as 14 years old. And at this time, he didn't have a car, and he relied on public transportation. Now, I know that you can't really say, well, you know, he couldn't borrow a car. Um, and two people claim that they saw him at the mall that day. One claimed to see him struggling with a young boy, luring him into a blue and white van. But in 1992, Dahmer actually denied abducting Adam. And I think it would be a little odd to deny that one, um, that one person, especially because he admitted to all of his other victims. And he even said that he felt bad for Adam due to his age. And even John Walsh kind of discounted Jeffrey Dahmer as the murderer of his son. Now, Edward James also confessed to the murder, and he drove a 1973 Plymouth Fury that was gone from his apartment for two weeks, and there was even a new seat cover installed, but there was no real evidence, con you know, like connecting him to the crime either. However, in 2008, Hollywood police chief Chad Wagner, taking along John Walsh by his side, announced the case closed, and they named Adam's murderer. And John believed, always believed, that this was the killer, and it's none other than Otis Toole. Of course, this announcement could have been made much sooner had authorities not made multiple crucial errors. John and Reve both expressed their disappointment in the way that their son's case was handled. There was the fact that they didn't really take the report serious enough. There was also laziness, arrogance, a lot of pride. Um, the police were very chaotic and disorganized. Um, they lost evidence, the, you know, the bloodstained carpeting from the car, so there was no DNA. They also lost the car itself a week before the FBI became involved, so I'm sure that that had a lot to do with just missing items, losing items. Um, and Reve actually pushed John to have the case reopened, and he had solved so many crimes. She said that, you know, you've caught over a thousand fugitives. Maybe let's give it one more push. And in 1998, Joe Matthews was the first person to see the photos of the Cadillac, which were never developed. And I'm baffled that it took so long to develop these photos of a crime scene. In, in, in these photos, there was the machete right there. There was a bloody image of Adam's face on the carpet right there. There was pictures of the car right there. Like, come on, 25 years is how long this process took. I just cannot believe that. But they finally got the answer and it was staring them in the face all along. However, let's just throw our hands up because, you know, we can't believe this dude who's confessed to so many other murders. Um, 
But following the crime, the Walsh family refused to be defeated, and they channeled their grief into becoming activists and helping others. And they have so many things. So they have done so much. The Adam Walsh Child Resource Center was founded. They have multiple locations, and John is actually still on the board of directors. They helped get the Political Missing Child Act of 1982 set into place. They also helped get the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children's started. They developed Code Adam, and this is where if you're ever out and about and you hear Code Adam come out, um, that means a child is missing, and um, the doors close, no one in, no one out. Um, the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act. And they started the process of putting children on milk cartons, shopping bags, flyers. They started fingerprint programs, increased securities in shops and schools, uh, missing, missing persons units, um, and the sex offender registry. It's crazy. And in 1988, John Walsh created America's Most Wanted, um, the National Crime Information Center. And he's actually also still doing In Pursuit with John Walsh. And I think uh, I think one of his sons actually um, is on the show with him now. Now, Adam's death was a tragedy and nothing can take away the hurt and heartbreak, but Adam didn't die in vain. His memory lives on and has helped countless children and families. Now, the family could finally move forward and they stated that it's not about closure, it's about justice. And I don't think that there really is any closure in the loss of a child, whether you get justice or not. Um, so on that note, I will see you next crime. Creepy Cases and Spooky Spaces with Cassiopeia is a Pizza and Pigtails production. All episodes are researched, written, and edited by yours truly. You can find new episodes every Friday with bonus episodes coming out every other Tuesday. You can find the podcast on your favorite listening platform, or now you can find it on YouTube as well. Don't forget to follow along on social media, creepycases.spookyspaces, for all future news updates and maybe some content that you won't find on the podcast. Also, be sure to subscribe so you can get access to bonus content, early access to content, and a couple of little thank you swag. If you'd like to contact me about appearing on a future episode, maybe you would like to suggest your own creepy case or spooky space, or maybe you'd also like to reach out about ad space, you can reach me directly at creepycases.spookyspaces at gmail.com or feel free to reach out through those social media platforms as well. And as always, see you next crime.